Welcome. If you're here right now, it's because you're a woman in the workplace, maybe a female entrepreneur, and you're ready to take yourself and your leadership to the next level. Now, here at Rise Up For You, we completely understand the challenges that we still face as women around the world when it comes to climbing the career ladder and really enhancing our profession. My name is Natalina Nasruddin. I'm the CEO and the founder of Rise Up For You, and I am so proud and honored to bring back the Women's Leadership Global Summit, where we bring you amazing women from around the world to speak to you on leadership, confidence, and negotiating and really learning how to be seen, be heard and be relevant in the workplace. This is a completely free event in honor of International Women's Day and Women's History Month and we would love for you to show up and attend. This is all about empowerment, education and really helping you reach your potential in your leadership, your business or any other area that you want to thrive in as a woman. Your time is now to be the best that you can be, and we're happy to be there along the way to support you and your journey. I want to introduce you to our next speaker. We were on stage together a couple months ago in Washington, D.C. We spoke at the Arab American Foundation Conference, and um, <clears throat> I had to have her. I, I've been following her work for a long time, and I knew she was going to be perfect. So I would love to bring on multi-award winning entrepreneur, global impact leader, public speaker, board member, any of you that are interested in becoming a board member, okay? Rania Hotet is a multi-award winning serial entrepreneur, global impact leader, author, advisor, and international speaker with recognitions from the White House, United Nations, United Kingdom House of Parliament, the Global CEO Excellence Award, Step Ahead Award, the Global Business Insights Award, and other prestigious honors. With the depth of her expertise and exceptional success record, Rania is a sought-after executive leadership consultant who guides in innovation transformation, human development, and business growth for companies around the world. Rania has been featured in notable publications, including Forbes, Huffington Post, Inc., Entrepreneur, I mean, can we get any better? The National Association of Manufacturers, and she was recently named by Disrupt Magazine, along with Oprah Winfrey, seven disruptive women paving the way for success in 2022. Come on, let's give it up for Rania Hotet. <laughs> You know what? With anticipation for your keynote. I love it. Ron, you were so honored to have you here. Um, it really is a pleasure. As I mentioned, I've been following your work for a long time, and I'm very happy to have you here today. I'm going to pass it over to you because I know you have some amazing information. We are excited to have you, and I'm going to pass it to you now. Thank you so much. Happy International Women's Day to everyone who's joining us. I'm very happy to be with you today, and I really hope everyone enjoys this talk. First, I want to start by saying that establishing equality and fairness is a fundamental human right. Yet it has been one of humanity's greatest challenges, especially for us women. Did you ever get the sense that history books and the media are filled with iconic accomplishments by men, for men, as if the archives of all human existence are solely lived experienced and discovered by fraternity, and as if women were virtually non-existent except in stories where they're rendered as seductresses and unintelligent inferior beings. But did women really do nothing from the dawn of civilization? Of course not. Throughout history, there have been many powerful women who led nations or guided armies into war renowned not only as fearsome fighters and fearless warriors, but also as brilliant strategists and inspiring leaders, starting with Vietnam's strong sisters who led the first national uprising against their Chinese conquerors in 40 AD, to the Celtic queen Budeca, who led a revolution and defeated the occupation of the Roman Empire between 60 and 61 AD, to the Pirate Queen of Ireland, Grace O'Malley, 
to Penthesilia, queen of the Amazons, who blazed through the Greeks like lightning and led her nation during the Trojan War to protect her people. To Ching Shi, the pirate lord who led 70,000 pirates. To Zenobia, the Syrian warrior queen of Palmyra in 269 AD. To ancient Egypt, Cleopatra and Nefertiti, the queen of the Nile in 1353 BC, who acquired unprecedented powers during their time. Powerful women in history didn't only lead nations and armies. There are many influential women of stellar accomplishments who made stunning creations, led groundbreaking discoveries, and pioneered game-changing inventions across STEM and humanities fields. And there are many more women leaders who have made a name for themselves in domains traditionally held by men and whose stories carried forward over the centuries and continue to be told today. The problem is that women forgot how powerful they can be. As history evolved, all our role models were replaced by male figures under patriarchal domination. And our societies adopted sexist ideologies and negative attitudes that restricted women, reduced their value, disconnected them from their inherent leadership powers and stripped them away from their legal, intellectual, and basic human rights. All the women whose contributions shaped civilizations and changed lives serve as inspiration for modern day societies and for all men and women alike. And they should be far more recognized and celebrated than they are. Yet, they have been overshadowed by the constant misogynistic distortions of history. In many cases, men became iconized based on stealing the ideas of brilliant women. They didn't only steal them, <laughs> they published them in journals, they won prizes for them, they earned millions from them and became noteworthy men of their time in retrospect. Meanwhile, the women whose insight and intelligence and ingenuity they appropriated were more often than not footnoted both in reality and through the lens of history. Such as the case with Tratula of Salerno, one of the earliest victims of historiographical misogyny. She was an Italian doctor in the 11th century and the world's first gynecologist her writings remained instrumental building blocks in our knowledge about human health and women's health specifically. And yet what happened? Historians and medical professionals were skeptical because how could a woman produce works of such accuracy or importance? And this convenient doubt ultimately allowed many male physicians over the years to cut and paste their own names over her work. This messed up assumption about women's ability is so ingrained until today. Another example, and I have a long list for you, Rosalind Franklin, who made one of the most important scientific revelations of the 20th century, which is uncovering the double helix formation that would catapult forward our understanding of human DNA. Her work was stolen by James Watson and Francis Crick who later received a Nobel Prize for the research they conducted based on her studies few years earlier. Lies Meitner, who made a groundbreaking discovery and research outlining the concept of nuclear fission that would give rise to the destructive capacity of the atomic bomb, good or bad, right? What happened to her? Her partner, Otto Hahn, omitted her name and he became the sole recipient of the 1944 prize in chemistry from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Hedy Lamarr, who many people know as a Hollywood celebrity and Hollywood actress, she created a radio guidance system, which was the basis for the omnipresent Wi-Fi, CDMA, and Bluetooth wireless technologies we have today. Her idea was stolen by the Navy who at first pretended that they have no interest in her work. 
but eventually they classified the patent and incorporated the technology into a host of new weapon systems during the World War II. Another example is Margaret Knight, who made her greatest contributions to production in 1868, when she invented a machine that automatically folded and glued paper bags into formations familiar to what shoppers use today. Her work was stolen by a random machinist named Charles Annan, who visited her plant and filed for a patent for her invention. She only learned about it when she applied for her own patent. And fortunately, she was one of the early inventors to fight for her rights. And eventually, a court's judgment gave her the patent and all future royalties were awarded to her as well. Ada Lovelace, who was one of the world's first computer geniuses, whose ideas marked the earliest recorded proposition for what would eventually become computer programming and algorithms. Her role is often minimized by male historians, and the credit is given to Charles Babbage. Today, her contributions are still obscured by debate, and most often by the dismissive and unmistakably misogynistic characterizations of her role. I have a few more. Evelyn Berzin, who didn't only develop the first ever computerized system for airline booking, but was also the one responsible for creating the first word processor in the world in 1971. Her work luckily was not stolen, but when she realized that her gender would make it impossible for her to move up the ladder in the industry and in business, she started her own company, Reductron, to launch her unique inventions into the market. And with that boldness, she set a great leadership example and entrepreneurial example for other women to follow. Emmy Dumuther, who is Albert Einstein himself, has described as the most important female in the entire history of mathematics. She came up with the principle that explains the relationship between the laws of conservation and symmetry. And the theorem she developed in 1920 served as the foundation of quantum physics, which helped Einstein formulate his general theory of relativity. But we don't hear much about her. We hear a lot about him. Another example in the arts and design, Elizabeth Maggie, who originally created and patented the landlord's game in 1904, which is regarded as the first ever version of Monopoly. And the game was designed originally to critique the injustices of unrestrained capitalism and the evil of business monopolies. Her work was stolen by an unemployed salesman. His name is Charles Darrow who stole the work, sold it to the Parker brothers in 1935, and on its way to retailing one of the most popular board games in history, what did she get out of it? She was only paid $500 for her stroke of gaming genius, while the man who stole her work became a millionaire. And until today, she's not recognized as the original inventor of the game. Margaret Kean, her case is amongst the most outrageous examples of chauvinistic greed on record. She's an American artist known for her big eyes paintings that became popular in the 1960s. What happened to her? Her husband, Walter, was selling her paintings as his own without her knowledge and permission. And he forced her silence by using threat, intimidation, and emotional abuse while he enjoyed celebrity and wealth. Eventually, she revealed the truth to the public, which led to a surreal courtroom scene in 1986, forcing the two into a head-to-head -head paint off, where she naturally produced a perfect copy of her earlier paintings, earning the rightful claim to her works. There is a beautiful movie by Tim Burton that I suggest that you watch. It's called Big Eyes. It's about her story. It's beautiful. Watch it. And last on my list 
is Candice Pert, who made a game-changing neuroscience revelation when she was a student by discovering the receptor that allows opiates to lock into the brain. Her work led to an award for Professor Dr. Solomon Snyder, who was recognized for his students' achievements. When she wrote a letter of protest to the award committee underscoring her determinant contributions, Dr. Snyder mansplained in response, and I quote, that's how the game is played, end quote. Of course, men like him have been playing this game for centuries, and it continues in modern academia and today's workplace. And the list goes on and on. Many women in history have proven themselves and shown the world how powerful they can be. But to pave the path forward, we must begin by correcting history and setting the record straight, both because Education is all about an endless quest for truth and because an equitable future in which women earn equal credit, respect, recognition, and financial rewards begin by acknowledging the sins of our past, by recognizing women for their brilliant contributions and abilities, and removing obstacles to female leadership. Women and leadership should be the expectation and not the exception. And although we have made many strides and gains since the beginning of the women's rights movement, progress has been slow. And we still have many obstacles to overcome in order to close the gender gap and strengthen the pipeline for the next generation of women leaders. So what are the causes of the gender gap and the obstacles to female leadership? Of course, there are many causes and obstacles that hinder women from advancing in their careers and moving into leadership roles, whether that is within the culture they grew up in or the companies they work for, or when starting their own ventures and leading their own companies or an organization, and whether they are experiencing blockages and self-sabotaging behaviors that's hindering their growth as well. But I'll focus on three key points in today's talk. One, poor negotiation skills and lack of self-confidence. From my experience in advising and coaching entrepreneurs, even employees in my own company and in other companies and young students, there are two major internal barriers that I commonly see in women, aside, of course, from the external obstacles that I'm about to discuss shortly. A, most women are often unprepared to answer fundamental existential questions such as why they do what they do, what are their priorities, what do they want to achieve, what are their career goals, how much money they want to make, how much they want to accomplish in their life and in their careers. As a result of that, they fail to effectively communicate what they want and to negotiate in order to get it. B, women often have lower expectations from themselves and from others because they lack the confidence in their abilities to reach higher levels of success. And they also doubt to receive the support that they need from their surrounding environment in order to achieve that success. So it is common that they systematically achieve less, not because they are women but because they have lower expectations that drive their behaviors to settle for less or hold themselves back. There's also a differential treatment of men and women when they attempt to negotiate. Employers tend to penalize women candidates more than male candidates for initiating negotiations, especially when the evaluators are males. Hence, women are less likely to negotiate their salaries or positions than men, and in many cases, they fear that advocating for a higher pay or for a higher position might present them with socially awkward situations or difficult conversations that they are not trained to handle. This hesitation combined with a lack of self-confidence and poor negotiation skills and other skills 
come at a huge cost for women. And over time, they can accumulate considerable monetary losses and miss on huge opportunities for growth throughout their careers if they don't master these skills early on. Two is gender biases and discrimination in hiring and in providing opportunities for women. The gender pay gap is one of the many reflections of gender bias that women face every single day. And what does gender bias exactly have to do with paychecks? Well, with all the deeply ingrained negative stereotypes, flawed perceptions, and popularized sexist ideologies about women's abilities and opportunities, issues such as pay disparity, occupational segregation, and fewer leadership opportunities continue to persist. Women are often stereotyped from the very first glance. I can't even count the times from my own experience where I'd be walking around LA, for example, and people would comment on my appearance and, and frequently ask me if I am a model, as if being an LA and born in a certain way doesn't earn me any other position. And no offense to being a model, of course, but I'm talking about perceptions and stereotyping. There were many other instances where people would say things to me, I didn't think that you are such a powerhouse or that you know this and that, or that you can do this and this. In other words, they're telling me that they underestimated me and assumed I lack intelligence or talent. When I was raising funds for my company, one VC asked me as I walked into the meeting, and I can never forget, and I quote word by word, what's a sexy girl like you doing in San Francisco? Imagine how offensive it can be when a woman is automatically reduced to an object or assumed to be unintelligent when you are presenting yourself in a wholesome, professional, and purposeful way. That's how automated these biases are. And I'm sure many women and many of you can relate to these situations as I speak, and I'm sure you have tons of stories to share about that. So a gender bias, whether conscious or unconscious, normally results in not rating women as highly capable, underestimating their intelligence, undervaluing the work that they do, and consequently not paying them their due and not supporting them to move into leadership positions. In employment, women are still paid on average less than men despite holding the same job title, similar work experience, and same educational levels. When a woman ends her formal education and begins employment, the gap might be small, but it tends to increase with age. Hence, differences among older workers are considerably larger than gaps among younger ones. According to a recent survey conducted by the Pew Research Center in October 2022, women ages 25 to 34 earned an average of 92 cents for every dollar earned by a man in the same age group, which is an eight cent gap. By comparison, the gender pay gap among older workers above that age that year was 18 cents. That's a 10 cent gap an additional gap from the younger group. In addition, wages and opportunities are affected by race and ethnicity, as well as gender. While women earn less than men despite academic achievements, white women earn more than Asian, Black, and Hispanic women at all educational levels. There is also an implicit bias against working mothers. And again, many of you can relate. Studies show that new moms are often perceived to have lower competence and commitment, and they face higher expectations and a lower chance of hiring and promotion. When in reality, women's decisions to leave the workforce or avoid aiming for higher positions have more to do with institutional and corporate barriers than with childcare and household duties which results in 14% of the wage gap. 
Therefore, it's important to settle one simple truth. Pay discrepancy is a direct result of extensive gender bias and discrimination against women in the workplace, combined with a general undervaluation of women's work, and employers are responsible for systemizing such disparities by creating hostile environment within their organizations and institutions that sabotage women's advancement into leadership positions. Statistics also show disparities when it comes to supporting and investing in women-led businesses. Male entrepreneurs are 86% more likely to be VC funded than their female counterparts. In the last two years, women only received 1% of all VC dollars in the US. So there's so much work to be done in this area. The third key point is gender differences in industry, occupations, and aspirations. One of the biggest causes accounting for half of the wage gap is the underrepresentation of women in leadership roles and high paying professions in business and politics, education, and STEM fields. According to the US Census Bureau's most recent analysis on the pay gap, women continue to be overrepresented in lower paying occupations relative to their share of the workforce. For women of color, leadership opportunities are even more elusive with fewer than 4% of executive officers and managers. Also with STEM careers, since STEM careers are in high demand in the context of the fourth industrial revolution, the current disparity is a real obstacle. And while parents and schools play a critical role, there's also a perception issue to be remedied by the industry itself. And I can speak from my position as a woman leader and a CEO who carved my lane in technology and manufacturing. Women constitute the largest pool of untapped talent in manufacturing in the United States, but it's still highly uncommon to expect women in this field. Tech companies are also lagging behind in gender equality. Female employees are underrepresented across eight tech industry giants based on a survey by Statista. And the worst performing companies, Microsoft and Google. Women struggle to make up a third of the total workforce. Only 15% of tech roles at Twitter are occupied by women. Not one of the companies surveyed had reached equal gender representation in their workforce. And they all had few women in leadership roles and doing tech jobs. It is no surprise that less than 15% of women are in senior leadership and executive positions. Of all S&P 500, men still hold 75% of executive and senior level positions, 80% of board seats, 94% of CEO positions, and 73% of the seats in Congress. Basically, the further we move up the ladder, the fewer women we see there. In fact, many women don't even want to be up there. Based on a recent study by the Pew Research Center, women in the US are less likely than men to say they are currently the boss or leader or a top manager at work. Women are also more likely to say they wouldn't want to be in this type of position in the future. That's more than four in 10 employed women. 46% say this compared with 37% of men. And again, that's not surprising based on all the data and information I shared already. So what do we do? What do we do to close the gender gap? How do we empower women? How do we remove obstacles to female leadership and strengthen the pipeline for women leaders? First, we must realize that leveling the field between men and women will have tremendous economic benefits. Diversity is our main key to unlocking growth and building a long-lasting, strong, and inclusive economy. Based on a study by the Institute for the Women's Policy Research, 
equal pay can add an additional income of $512.6 billion to the U.S. economy alone, and it can cut poverty rate by half. Another report by McKinsey Global Institute found that narrowing the gender gap and labor force participation holds the potential to add $12 trillion to the global GDP by 2025. However, in order to reap the benefits, we must get to the root causes of gender biases and remove obstacles that keep women from advancing within the workplace, both in magnitude and levels of seniority, which will require major reforms at all organizational, individual, societal, and political levels. So first, at an individual level, providing education and training. Closing the gender gap and having more women leaders requires empowering women at an individual level. Economic data still prove major disparities in education. The number of women earning degrees hasn't increased given that a large proportion of women are choosing not to go into male dominated areas such as STEM fields. So more work needs to be done when it comes to advocating for the rights of women and girls to equality and quality in education and lifelong training, including preschool provision, elimination of stereotype teaching and education materials, diversification of the training opportunities available to women and girls, and the promotion of self-esteem and leadership. Providing employment and job training as well as literacy training for women past traditional school age should also be an area of special focus to ensure that all women at all ages are empowered and educated and have the skills to thrive. And the second aspect is developing personal and professional skills. Women need to develop a deep understanding of themselves, of their own value based on making assessments and having the knowledge of their own competencies and aspirations and purpose what skills they need to learn to become better and more competent for leadership, what behaviors they need to change or adjust in order to be more empowered to follow their aspirations and align with their purpose. So I personally encourage women to build the courage for themselves, to be able to stand up for themselves. They shouldn't feel like they have to adapt their behaviors to the discrimination against them, nor they should cower in the face of external barriers. They need to develop resilience, a strong sense of identity and self-confidence to pursue their goals and leave their mark on the world. Yes, discrimination is real. Sexism is real. Pay disparities and gender inequalities and other injustices against women are real barriers, but no woman needs permission to be a leader. Nothing can stop a woman who knows her self-worth and has the strength to hold herself and others accountable. And nothing can stop a woman who has the willpower to carve her own path and the determination to succeed. So we have to take responsibility for ourselves. At an organizational level, A, building diverse and supportive organizational structures. Economic data still prove that hiring women hasn't increased and the number of women in leadership are not at parity in any industry whatsoever. But equality cannot be an afterthought. It must be embedded in the company's culture from the get-go. The first policy I crafted as CEO of ID4A Technologies, we named it the one for one policy, where for every man we hire a woman at the exact same wages as hired and vice versa. Over the last six years of growth before we got acquired a few months ago, we made conscious efforts to seek out female talents and increase equality between our employees. And the process, 
We trained over 334 of our male and female employees on gender bias and provided tools and strategies forcing mindset shifts to facilitate efficient and respectful cooperation between men and women employees, and also to help them see each other as equals. All these efforts produce phenomenal business growth. And if we didn't set the tone from the get-go, we would have been another bad example of leadership. CEOs and business leaders must set the tone and proactively cultivate diversity, monitor gender discrimination, conduct salary audits, address gender pay differences, and commit to fair hiring and promotion practices. Because talented, driven, and intelligent women deserve opportunities to lead. And companies need their leadership in order to thrive. Therefore, companies must take responsibility of creating an entire organization structure and culture to support women's career and development and to ensure that they have the best chances to advance into top level positions and leadership roles. B, eliminating all forms of discrimination against women. And let me clear something. Discrimination and inequality are two distinct problems. They are not one and the same. While gender pay gap is a metric that helps us to measure difference in wages or incomes between men and women, it doesn't capture inequality accounting for the underlying differences along other dimensions, such as treatment and education, experience, occupation, et cetera. Large pay gaps might exist in the absence of discrimination, where women are being treated fairly, but paid unequally to men. Conversely, discrimination in hiring processes might exist in the absence of wage gaps. That said, both discrimination and inequality must be tackled because neither one is a sufficient indicator on its own of what women experience in the workplace and what opportunities they have access to or don't. Thus, organizations must continue to evaluate their data, improve the hiring and compensation processes, as well as taking the appropriate measures to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women by any person within the organization or enterprise or institution, and providing a legal framework for women's empowerment and participation and the development process of such measures. It is not enough to pay women the same as men or promote them into higher positions or leadership roles, yet still perceive them as less than in any way. At a societal level, we need to build strategies for cooperation with men. All the diversity challenges of male-dominated industries and sexist corporate institutional and organizational cultures reveal the profound need for more enlightened men allies who can have an impact on pushing the case for gender equity and can set a new example for other men to follow while building a new level of trust by investing in women and actively engaging to change the culture that is hindering the advancement of women from the classroom to the boardroom. At a political level, advocating for fair policies. The inclusion of a range of civil society actors, diverse groupings of representatives from different disciplines, the public and the private sectors, all will serve to consolidate a critical mass of support for gender sensitive programming and will ensure that the voices and the visions of women at the grassroots levels are brought into policy making processes. Improving the scope of Equal Pay Act and updating the Paycheck Fairness Act can enhance federal enforcement efforts by offering stronger incentives for employers to obey the law and prohibiting retaliation against workers who are negotiating salaries or asking about wage practices or promotions. Advocating for fair policies such as equal pay, 
equal parental leave policies, equal opportunities for advancements and other measures are also crucial to legitimize gender issues and reduce biases. Additionally, when men's voices join women in advocating for these policies on the corporate, state, national, and international level, we double our collective power and speed up the process towards closing the gender gap and increasing women's representation and leadership roles. Women leadership is so important for ensuring that more women are in positions where they can have the authority to decide and negotiate on issues that affect us. But until we seriously commit to gender equality and consciously address gender biases, it will be extremely challenging to overcome all the obstacles to female leadership. And it will be impossible to integrate women fairly and efficiently within the global economy. All that said, there is never enough initiative to solve these issues, which means we are all responsible. And for those of us who already created a path to success, we must utilize our experiences and positions of influence to advocate for women, to support them, to empower them, and to inspire them to lead forward. Today, women are an emerging force for leadership, but we need to encourage their participation and invest in the development of a critical mass of rising women leaders because this means prosperity that can have a potentially exponential reach to all of us around the globe. Thank you so much. Wow, that was Awesome. Thank you. So yeah, I'm seeing it in the comments. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Rania, thank you so much for that. That was, I, I would say, very, very robust and very 360. I love how you broke down in the beginning the history and some of the challenges that we have faced that I have not heard about, right? And many of us haven't. So it's very important for us to understand it, but also you gave strategy. And you gave strategy on an instant on an institutional level all the way down to the individual level, which I think is very important. And we started the conference that way, that you know, it's gonna take unfortunately a little bit more time to create systemic and institutional change. But if we can individually contribute every single day to the success of an elevating women, and just like you mentioned, women that are already in leadership positions continuing to bring up other women instead of pushing them down or feeling you know scarcity around it i think we can make some significant change um faster than we think so i really i really loved your your keynote and your talk we have we have a couple questions but it's okay i just want to um, ask you one from our audience that i that i read and um this is from renetta who asked how do you react as it, like in the moment, real time, how do you react when facing biased comments? Like what is the behavior that happens, you know, when you're sitting there and somebody says something to you? Thank you, Renata, for your question. Sure. I mean, there are so many different scenarios when this happens. Some people yeah. make comments about how you look. People make a comment about your hair. <laughs> people make a comment about how you're dressed. People make a comment about so many different things. So Discrimination comes in so many different forms. And I think the best way to be prepared for these moments is to have so much time for yourself where you are empowering yourself and building your own self-confidence. So when you are faced with any type of discrimination, you can stand up for it. And you have an opportunity to educate the person about their behavior and calling it out. Don't feel that you need to stay quiet and say nothing about it. You have an opportunity in that moment to change the conversation and change someone else's behavior towards you by making sure that in that moment you are empowered. As long as you're confident and you know who you are and you know that this moment you are being discriminated, you can identify that and you can quickly call it out. And, and again, there are so many scenarios. So if we have specific scenarios, I can give you more guidance. But in general, don't be quiet. Don't stay silent. Stand up 
to the person, say something about it, tell them that what they said to you makes you feel uncomfortable or it's, it's a stereotypical way of viewing women or, or it's unfair that you would be treated this way or spoken to this way. Don't accept what's coming at you when you know it's wrong. Um, so it's an opportunity for you to stand up for yourself. It's also an opportunity for you to educate someone else and calling them out on their bad behavior. So never miss that opportunity because at the end of it, you will go home, you sucked it up, you're gonna be resentful, you're gonna hate yourself, you're gonna project that on other people, it's gonna hinder you from advancing. And every moment you stand up to discrimination, you're gonna feel more and more and more confident and more and more and more powerful and more resilient and nothing will affect you the same way it happens. So it's a practice and it takes a lot of practice to get there because we are, we have the tendency to just stay silent, not know how to react. We go into freeze mode sometimes, which is very normal, but we got to train ourselves. And, and I've been in that situation so many times where I didn't know how to handle it. And I had to practice and I had to train myself until that became a natural response where no, you say no, and you stop the person and you change the conversation and you take your power back. 100%. And I love the teachable moments, the opportunity to teach and educate, because it's remembering that not only am I sticking up for myself, but I am sticking up for any other individual that can potentially have the same behavior from this leader or from this person, right? Because the more we create teachable moments, the more that individual is going to recognize that maybe I shouldn't be saying these things or responding or reacting in this way. It's bigger than just us, right? I, I love that. Rania, Absolutely. it has been such an honor to have you here. How can we connect with you? Your LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, where can we follow you? Just by the chat alone, I know that the women here would love to continue to follow your story and your journey. You can connect anywhere on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. I'm on Twitter, but I'm not as active as other platforms. You can also connect with me on my website if you have any requests as well. You can find me on YouTube. My channel is not very robust yet, but you can also follow me there. There will be a lot of videos coming up on that channel. So social media is always the best way. My website is there if you want to contact me. And again, YouTube, if you want to follow more content in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rania. Everyone, let's give Rania some praise in the chat and hands up. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone, and happy International Women's Day. Go rock it. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.